welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the session and of course to MERTAC. This session is Ask Us Anything. Leading tech consultants take your questions. As the president of Return on Information Consulting, Tammy Duplantis has leveraged more than 22 years of technology leadership experience with iconic brands including TGI Fridays, Applebee's, and Potbelly. Tammy helps companies solve business challenges and enable growth strategies through technology transformation in their C-suite. Tammy is also a recipient of the 2018 Innovator Award for Top Women in Restaurant Technology. Fred LaFranc is a well-respected industry veteran who has advised many of the industry's most significant executives and companies from startups to billion-dollar global chains. <laughs> Sorry, can hold this. Sorry, just, so, it's, so it's clear um, to deliver long-term sustainable success. And currently, Fred holds the position of president, CEO, chaos strategist, and consultant with results through strategy, a restaurant consulting company he founded in 2006. His mission is to support owners and executives while driving change and implementing long-term sustainable growth strategies. Tony Malbeck is an operational technologist who began his career in the hotel industry, coming up through the operations ranks before getting into hotel technology. In 2008, he joined the Independent Purchasing Cooperative and was responsible for building and managing the team that led to the creation of a standard POS and technology platform for all restaurants worldwide. Toby currently manages the daily operations for Constrata as their managing director. And Joe Tenzar specializes in the strategic focus of emerging technologies role as a business driver. He is the founding partner of Restaurant CIOs, a strategic advisory company where he and his CIO partners collaborate to help the hospitality companies see their restaurant business through the eyes of seasoned CIOs. Joe also acts as the chief, tech, chief strategy officer and chief information officer for Sunny's Barbecue, one of the most popular barbecue restaurant companies in the country. Please welcome our panelists, and thank you, Fred. Thank you. All right. Well, first off, one thing that was not mentioned is that we're all fundamentally unemployable. That's why we're consultants. So, um, When I was a restaurant CEO, and I did that for half a dozen companies, I absolutely hated consultants. And I still do. Um, uh, because we're misunderstood. So we're, we're, we're going to try and give you a panel today to help you understand best how to use us. Uh, so that, yes, you can ask us questions, and we're going, to, we're going to try and get a framework here so you understand how we can try and do it. But let's start off by understanding who's in the room. So how many operators in the room are here in the, from the tech teams? Tech. Okay, quite a few. All right, how about operations? Okay, so the, for the operators, congratulations. It's nice to see operators in the room come and get educated about technology. We need much more of that. Uh, I have another question for all the tech people. How many of you see yourself as a CEO one day? Okay, good, good. Last time I asked that question, like 400 people, no one raised their hand. So it's good to see that it's changing. So technology's going there. How many vendors are in the room? Okay. Now vendors, of course, want to know the magic of selling to operators. We're going to explore a little bit of that today, give you some insight into it. And operators, uh, I'm hoping that you get a newfound respect for the benefit and value that uh, people bring to this, this consulting world. So the, what I want to do to set a context, I want to have the conversation at a higher level than just sort of what POS system should I buy. I really want to get into that. And anyone here want to talk about PCI compliance? Oh, thank God. Okay, you do. Okay, well, no. God. All right. I think it was six years in a row we had PCI compliance panels. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about systems intelligence. There's a book written by John Mackey called Conscious Capitalism. We talked about the importance of system intelligence, and it got me thinking about how we have to look, learn to view it in an organization. So I just want to give you a real brief overview to sort of set the stage about what we look for in an organization. So this is a, a actually this is a, a graphic that I use for the Tau Group. Everyone familiar with the Tau Group here, you know, in, in Vegas? They're huge business global. It's been a client for a few years. And we wanted to show them the various functions that exist in their company. And we went through each one of these. I'm not going to read them aloud. You can look at them very quickly. And says, okay, so systems intelligence is understanding how these all interrelate. These, this is your cross-functional organization. But most importantly, what I wanted to share with you is to really say, how does this really fit in the org chart? And there are four foundational departments that are actually that cover the entire spectrum of an organization. And those from top to bottom is human resources or talent management and culture. Next is followed by technology, which many of you are represented in. 
finance, and then project management administration. These four functions exist throughout the entire organization. That's pretty much how it works. Above that, all the other functions sit as discrete functions on top of them. But it's important for a technologist to understand all of them. And one of the things that we've seen, if you go way back to the days of personnel, before it was called human resources, uh, it was you know, typically a, a female person, and they never sat at the big table. They finally got the chance to sit at the big table when finally companies realized, hey, we employ people. People might be important here. And technology also has evolved their role. You know, it used to be kind of the thing about, you know, lock him in the closet, throw some raw meat at the IT guy, and he'll be fine. Okay? But that doesn't work anymore. It was really interesting to see what happened with marketing. You know, marketing went from the chief marketing officer to the chief marketing and technology officer. In fact, marketing's technology budget is bigger than IT budgets in many companies nowadays. So they had to get along. So I would talk to CMOs and say, got to go talk to the IT guy. And they'd be, well, he's kind of weird. Well, guess what? They think you're kind of an idiot. So it's okay. You know, you just got to cats and dogs got to learn how to sort of get along together. And, and it was an important process of evolution. So now the CMTO is now a CXO, Chief Experience Officer. COVID, thank you for that, forced that because all of a sudden the guest journey was digital. And, it's, and they've now gone back into the restaurants and realized, you know what, it's still digital. We need to catch up. So I wanted you to sort of get this context of why you need to look at it from that point of view. And as a leader in an organization, you need to understand how the whole organization works. And when any one of us walks into an organization, we're going to look at all these systems. And what I'm going to share with you is just a real quick look at when we look at an organization. These are various functions that exist. And we look at how do these sit discreetly. It's all part of an ecosystem. They all got to work together. And we rank them. The colors on top of the little hats is the ranking about whether they exist, don't exist, how good they are, and so forth and so on. And it's, a bit, you know, it's the base needs are the blue ones, the essential ones are the green ones, and the differentiations are the red ones based on your concept and your brand. Okay, so you know you need to have an email system. You don't need to have a payroll system. You got that. But then there's other things to be involved in that based on your concept. All right, so that's a little bit of how it works. And then lastly, in order for, for the non-tech people, because this is the challenge, how many of you report to a CFO or a CEO that is really knowledgeable about technology? Raise your hand. All right, two people and a couple, of, and the rest of them are like, no fucking way. <laughs> all right, and that's the problem, right? So you're, you're, you're basically having to sell into ignorance at all times, right? And it's that, that's not a negative. It is what it is. So how do you educate them? So I'm trying to give you some context to do it. So I created this one to help sort of the non-tech people understand it. There's four quadrants here. The guest-facing operational is obvious, drive-through kiosk, counter kiosk, digital displays, payment connectors, order-ready screen. Those things are up front in, in the dining rooms or up in your drive-through lanes. The internal one to operational, this is the granddaddy, POS systems, you know, labor scheduling, intelligent kitchen, you know, the KDS, inventory management, all that's happening back there. This has been around for a long, long time. Lower left-hand corner, revenue generation financial. This is the sexy one. This is the one that's gotten all the attention. This is all the apps and online ordering, loyalty CRM, so forth and so on, stored value cards, digital wallet, and a lot of attention is being played here. However, I would submit that the last quadrant on the lower right-hand side, analytics, that's where the money's going to go. Because right now we're drowning in debt and we're starved for knowledge. And all these operators are, have so much information, but they don't know what to do with it. And what's the most relevant, critical thing? And so this is going away, away from the old BI tools where they're just providing you diagnostics. You're now going to start getting into prescriptive information through AI that's telling you what to do, okay, to help your operations. Given the labor shortages we have, this is really important. How many of your operators are trained to read a financial statement? You know, very few really understand that, much less a diagnostic report. So this gives you sort of a context of what it is. And I'm just going to ask some initial questions to prime the pump because this is really for you to ask questions of them. Uh, so, Toby, uh, you know, you've been around for a long time, as we know that. Uh, you've seen the industry evolve and the demand for tech grow tremendously, and especially in the last three years, it's probably gone faster than it has in the last five years. Uh, so, as you look at this, what type of qualities make for a great relationship with a client? What do you look for? Well, the first thing is that if the client has to buy into the process. So it has to be a situation where it's not just a part of the organization that sees that there needs to be some change that goes on. So it really becomes a groundswell movement. And so, first of all, you know, as a consultant, and I'm sure everybody up here would agree to it, we need to bring the legitimacy of understanding the operational environment. Now, bringing somebody from the outside world because they can make beautiful PowerPoint presentations isn't going to help your business. And the last thing you want to do is spend the first three months having me learn your business. So if, if a consultant can come in and understand your business already, or basically understand the landscape, and you can get that buy-in from the organization, really from the top down, 
um, then you could be very successful. And sometimes, it, it, you know, I, I like to say all the time, uh, you know, there's such a thing as a benevolent dictatorship. Sometimes somebody has to step into the organization and say, look, we're bringing these folks in. Technology is about change. Operations uh, require that to occur. And you've got to recognize that, that there's going to be change that goes in your organization be able to leverage the newer technologies that exist out there. Yeah. So the advantage that all of us bring into a situation is because we've seen so many companies, we can walk in and assess fairly rapidly kind of where you're at and to begin to get an understanding of how we can improve it. Uh, Tammy, you're kind of a unicorn, uh, not just because you're a female up here, but you've actually worked three sides of the stool. You've worked as an operator, you've worked for vendors, and now you work as a consultant. So in, from that standpoint, what is the best type of relationship you think can exist between that th the three legs? Because you've got vendors in here who are dying to work with operators. You've got operators here saying, oh, don't sell me something I don't need. And you're trying to sort of you know, be the midpoint between that. So what's the best advice you have for that? Yep. It certainly helps to have been on all sides. Um, you kind of have credibility in speaking on behalf of them. Um, but echoing what Toby said, I think the very first thing I always ask for is that there's an executive sponsor. Which executive has their neck on the line and can't be the IT guy? And number one, it's not an IT project. This is, this is a strategic initiative for the, for the brand, and if it's not, it probably won't work. So with the executive sponsors, usually uh, head of operations or head of marketing, um, and then a cross-functional team internally that includes all departments that have some stake in that solution that you're implementing. And I, I always start there if it's, and then I act as sort of a program manager because I've been at the table as the head of IT and because I've been as the vendor, I usually run the program and it starts with getting all the right players around the table and understand in a line, total alignment, top down like you said, uh, but alignment across cross-functionally as well. Uh, the, the way that I think the relationships work really well um, is that the key vendor partners, sometimes we, we help you select a solution, and that is having a fair um, RFP process or selection process where IT does not pick the solution, but you have all the cross-functional teams weigh in on it um, and have the vendor partners actually a part of the team. And I usually have a call a week that includes, it's just, it's just the boots on the ground running the project, it's the vendor partners doing the work, it's the IT team building it, it's the, uh, the stakeholders and the ops and the training teams, uh, and we go through where are we going and what's the status and high level, are we on track or not, uh, and then breakout sessions. And usually I have a call with each vendor weekly, and if they're collaborating on something, I have a call with that whole group, and we just talk through in detail what are we building? How is it going? And just tons of communication. I mean, it's almost like we've all dropped the walls. We've all gathered around the table, and we're on one team. That's great. I appreciate that. Joe, I'm going to give, ask you a slightly different question, because talking to the IT people in the room, because you and I have talked about the importance of technology. I just shared sort of how it fits in the organization as a foundational department. But how does uh, a tech executive really get to the big table and really learn how to contribute to the business planning what's going on? So that they're, they're sort of thought about, just like now, human resources, first step, the technology piece, because it's so critical. What do you recommend to these IT executives? Well, you, you need to speak to the executives, um, to your, your partners, I guess, if you are embedded in the company as an executive, um, in the language that they understand, right? Um, I've got probably more of a business background than I do a technology background, and, and that's really helpful when you're talking to the CFOs and the CEOs and understand what their objectives are. Um, delivering upon those objectives, delivering tr or um, delivering these projects, build this trust over time. Trust gets you closer to the table, and, and the more things you do that show that you can move the needle or, or help them satisfy their objectives, you're you're basically basically you have yourself a seat. So um, you know it's all about understanding what they need and you having some aptitude to get it there, and um, and you know over, over time you just build the trust. Yeah, and, it, and really for the tech executives, spending time with the people that you support to really understand their business function and purpose gives you a big difference because you have a, a really unique view. So now I want to talk to, to you to give you an opportunity to ask any, any one of us questions. Toby, they're going to steal your microphone so she can run around the room. Uh, if you guys are strategic, you can get her running back and forth at different <laughs> angles. So just, you know, you can keep that in mind if you want to have a kind of a pinball game up here. Uh, so, again, ask your question. If there's a specific person you want to answer the question, please refer to them. 
Uh, we've asked panelists to provide a brief reply, and the further information is required just to talk about it <laughs> offline. We don't want to go down a rabbit hole. We really want to get as much benefit of the time. We're going to give you the maximum amount of time. We've got over 30 minutes here. So who has a question? And if you have no questions... You're all expecting this to be What's some kind of boxing match. No, no, no. This is, yeah. There we go. There's one there. back there. Okay, so $1,000 an hour for free. Okay, here we go. <laughs> don't start the clock yet. This is very focused, and I apologize if it's too narrow, but... Um, so the 80-20 rule for tips and tip credits has just gone into effect a couple of months ago. Has anybody got a solution to automate the additional pay that is required for those tip servers to bring their pay into compliance? Too focused, right? The last place I was, they, they wrote custom code to figure it out. So data would come out of the point of sale collecting all the tip data, and there was a, a custom engine that would compute um, how to round it up. I'm going to ask John Moody. John, are you guys doing anything in that area? John's one of the founders of Restaurant 365. Okay. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we're working on a tip solution that's, that's fully integrated. Yeah. There's an, and also, along tips, not your question, but there's a company called Kickfin, that also allows you to pay out Kickfin, K-I-C-K-F-I-N. That allows you to pay out tips because a lot of restaurants don't have cash anymore. I mean, they end up at the end of the night. They, there's no money to give out to the employees. This is a way to get the money in their hands instantly. And that's that's tipsy as well. Yeah, that's that's a good solution. All right, all right, John. Good plug for you. All right. Any any? Okay, here we go. Good. You guys, are, you're following my lead. You're going from angle to angle. That's perfect. That's good. Back, we're going to be looking for one way back there. <laughs> um, I, a lot of these panels and this kind of conversation has been on a more national, large-scale uh, perspective. And for people like my company is more on a regional, smaller scale, how do you recommend implementing this kind of technology and actually need, if, I'm, if I say so, if I can say so, but um, not only in a cost-efficient manner, but in a limited uh, staffing capacity? I'm going to take a first crack and then I'm going to pass it on. So first off, here's the good news. The cost of doing technology solutions has dropped tremendously over the last few years. Okay, just like, you know, other electronic things we used to, it, keep, it keeps on going down. So that's the good news. You can play with the big boys. Uh, and in fact, social media has been a great leveler because you can be a tiny little company and, and you know, you know there's a, I have a great cartoon on my desk that shows a dog typing on a laptop and there's a dog on the ground and the dog typing the laptop looks down and says, you know, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. And so that's true. So you, ha you have that advantage. Uh, and then what I would say is this is where vendors can be really helpful to you, uh, especially the ones you can trust to be truthful with you and not try and sell you something you don't really need. They are a great resource. And needless to say, this group right here, great resource to help you understand how to think about it. Not necessarily provide you the solution, but how to think about it. But let you take yeah, it. I think that's more about it. It's, it's about, like I said, understanding the objectives, but it's, it's not chasing the shiny objects. It's doing what your peers are doing because you are unique in the industry, right? It's the first thing that, that my, and my, my company does a little bit different than the rest of these. I mean, we do strategic advisement for mid-market brands mostly. I'm a, I'm a fractional CIO for multiple brands. And, you know, the thing that you do in this situation when you've got limited resources in in technology, limited resources in marketing, limited all across the board, is you try to find things. That you, first of all, you have to prioritize what is very important for your brand, what what gets you closest to those objectives soonest. So you're doing prioritization. You're very transparent on um, you know the fact that there's there's money, time, and quality. The, the you know the three-legged stool, and you know you've got to give on one of those, and you got to make sure that everyone understands that, and it's very transparent about where you're spending your time and money at this point and how that will help you get to the next step. And then you, you just kind of chip away at it. But vendors is absolutely the, the key there. And don't stay far away from custom solutions or, or you know, these massive enterprise solutions that may or may not suit you well. Try to get fully integrated as much as you can. You know, I, would, I would not do best of breed in your situation in a lot of cases. Um, you probably want something that's a fully integrated system, although it may not be the best of everything. It will be the easiest and to And yeah, don't look to customize anything. You're going to have to really work with what's off the shelf because... No one wants to spend time in a small company customizing something without charging you. If it's if you're young brands, yes, but not necessarily a small one. Toby, you have a comment on this, or Tammy, one of the two? Okay. Well, a recommendation would be 
don't buy or implement anything until someone acts as your trusted chief technology advisor and architects the whole solution. Because, I mean, we have all walked in where it's just like somebody went through and just picked a bunch of things off a shelf. They don't talk. They don't integrate. What was the end goal? And your tech stack will just be a ball of yarn like, like almost all of us have probably. It's more of a hairball. It's more of a hairball. A hairball. Yeah. So, I, but it's really important to bring in someone that can help you, whether it's a, a head of IT, a fractional CIO, a gun for hire, or someone you trust that helps you figure out what, it, what do you want to have in your tech stack and then start with the, the core foundation pieces that everything else has to plug into. Because the worst thing is, is picking point solutions and then implementing a few of them. And then you don't get the bang for the buck and they don't talk to each other. Everyone gets frustrated and, and pulls the plug on the whole thing. If you've got franchisees, there's a revolt. So I, I would recommend getting yeah. a, and that's a why well I showed this, that's why I showed this graphic. So what, yeah. what is the base? What do you have to have? Then what becomes your core solutions, and ultimately, what are the differentiators for you? And it's going to take some time. It doesn't happen overnight. So I think time is definitely right on. Toby? The other thing to keep in mind is there's no such thing as a technology strategy without a business plan. So th the idea that, that somehow the IT folks can concoct a, a business, an IT strategy without understanding the business is, is foolish. And some people up here have already said it. If you're not connected to the business, you're not connected to technology. So as you're a small organization, it doesn't make any difference whether you're big or small. That, that business plan is still what predicates everything. Are you going to grow outside of your, your state that you're currently residing in? Are you going to franchise? Are you changing your business model? Are you going to go ghost kitchen? Are you going to change your delivery model exponentially in some way? And all those things get put into this big pot, and as everybody set up here, it kind of gets boiled and percolated. And the smaller your brand is, the fewer resources you have, the more you look for stuff within the same solution. And you're going to have to make some compromises as, as it gets to that. But stay away, as I think Joe said, from customizing um, and just realize that the business gets driven by the people who are in the operations world. You are a servant to them. And um, you have to follow the technology and let follow where the puck is going. Don't, don't worry about what technology does today. You need to follow the puck because by the time you deploy it, implement it, get everybody trained, go through change management and all the processes, the world has changed and the puck has moved. Yeah, great, great points. Good question. All right. Oh, now we got more interest. Got there we go. Minutes. Okay. They're keeping you in exercise. This is good. This is, you're going to get 10,000 steps today. I always do at Mertech. Hi. Uh, Mark Sheen from Grimaldi's. Um, we are uh, cognizant of the fact that we're uh, growing all of our platforms. Um, we're, we're trying to go from zero process to some process. And my question is, when you all go into an organization and you take a look around, what are some of the things, what are some of the things that you're looking for to say to you, this is a great process or this is a mature organization or they have integrated this well? What are some of the things that those of us who are um, trying to grow our processes to be more mature should look at generally? Technology is the great magnifying glass. It really is. If you, if you implement technology with poor processes, it looks bone ugly. It just, it, your, your world falls apart. So one of the things we look for are mature business processes that aren't predicated on tribal knowledge. They're not predicated on the fact that you put in a POS system 40 years ago and this is why you do a certain way. And your organization has to be open for, for change. It has to be willing to look at that and look itself square in the eye and say, we know that our business process isn't solid and we need to re revise it. The technologies that you'll see on the floor here are some of the state-of-the-art technologies that we have in our industry. They require that you make a leap of operational faith in many cases. And if you're not willing to do that, you're not mature enough to, to, to take on these new technologies. Yeah, so te technology does not replace bad food and bad service. Okay? What it does is it accelerates and amplifies that which you're good at. So we, I always like to look at what are you really great at and now how can I find a way to make it frictionless so that it makes it easier and faster. There's a word called combinatorial, which is essentially one plus one equals three. Technology can help you do that. Uh, and, and that's why I had that quadrant, because there's stuff that you can do in the back of the house that creates incredible efficiencies, and there's stuff in the front of the house to help you with greater sales and revenue generation. They're uniquely different. And that's why it's important, I think Tammy said it earlier, you gotta have a map, you gotta have an architecture, otherwise there's no point. Uh, and, and then the other thing is that you have to ask yourself, what is the quality of my employee in terms of understanding the technology we have? 
So I, I ran a Burger King franchise for about three years, a few years ago. And frankly, it was all minimum wage employees. Well, minimum wage employees, they're the ones that nobody else would hire. And they ended up at this Burger King. So we could not give them a very, very uh, complex solution. We created simple dashboards. I used Miris, who's represented here, to help us work with uh, interface with SciComm, which is what Burger King used. So you've got to also look at the quality of that employer to say, what do they really need to make successful? I really believe that every employee in the business needs to have the information that they need to self-manage, and technology provides you that. But you have to understand, who is it that I'm looking at? Does it have to be visual? Can they read it? You know, there's a lot of companies now that have you know, English as a second language is a priority, and so it's a different need. Joe, any other comment? I just want to receive those first. I guess the question is what, and I don't know if we hit, pro, when you said mature processes, are you talking about steps of service? Or are, you talk, are, you, are you talking about um, HR processes and hiring processes? You know, everything in the entire organization, because I think that's important to understand first. Yeah, um, I would say us in particular, we're looking at um, across the board, but specifically maybe change management processes, yeah. uh, you know, project management processes, things like this that we're coming from either zero or very rudimentary and trying to get to where we have mature and, um, you know, almost second nature processes in, in those areas. And just wondering maybe how you would prioritize some of those internal processes um, versus you know what you what you guys are talking about, which is uh, a lot of customer facing uh, things, which I think we're actually very good at. Yeah, you know, it's glad you mentioned change management because that's probably the most overlooked in, you know, in immature technology organizations that that exist. And um, you know, there's nothing more difficult than change management when you roll something out. It, it, you know, it, it's, the, it's the training, it's the supports, the follow-up, it's the, it's the iterations of improvement. It's, it, there's all sorts of things after you, you, you roll something out that's as important or, or more important than, than getting to that point. And that's where, I, you know, I don't know what percentage is, I'm sure Fred's got a number in his head, that, uh, you know, the, the projects that fail because you don't have that level of maturity. And I think, so that's a really good place to start, especially as it, as it, as it uh, relates to technology. Um, from a, just general processes and, and, and you know, you, you look at, I'll put my, my chief strategy officer hat on, I mean, you, you have to start everything with a purpose, right? And, you know, what are, you know, where, where should you... I wouldn't necessarily go down a rabbit hole and try to improve processes in one little narrow scope if there's something that's greater, it has greater value to the company. So you, you start with, you know, what do you, what's your vision for the company and, you know, what are these, what are the objectives that are going to get you there? What are the focus areas that you want to be, and then you tie every project to those. And then those will, once you get to a point of understanding those focus areas and, and, and objectives in each one of those focus areas, you'll really quickly determine where you've got to spend your efforts in order to move that needle to get you where you want to go. So it's a strategic kind of thinking behind some things. But, um, you know, it's hard to say that, you know, I would, I would focus in one particular area of, of process over another until you really understand what drives your business. Tam Tammy said it earlier, and she's right about this. If you begin to have not just a a project lead to interface with, but now you start having smaller meetings within the organization that are, that are going to be affected by the change. So number one, map out workflows to see what they're currently doing and then show them how the technology may in fact make it a lot easier for them to do the job. You, they will embrace it. Anything that requires behavior change is the most difficult thing in the world. Um, and ironically, culture has a lot to do with it. You know, there's, there's cultures that embrace change. There's other cultures that do everything they can to resist change. And so we had to sort of read that and say, uh-oh, we got to come in here and do something. Because, you know, the typical thing, CEO goes to a conference, comes back, oh, the, the latest flavor of the month, right? And then that's what creates frustration for organizations as well. Okay, there's and another question. I want to add one. Did, did, okay, did the I'm sorry, did you go say something, Tammy? Oh, you asked about, you included project management, which, which I thought was interesting. Are, are you an IT person? Well... So this is, this is real and all the way back to 2001. There was no such thing as PMP certifications and all that kind of stuff. And I joined Applebee's at, to run IT and started this uh, project management culture. My CFO was also uh, supportive of this. And I know this sounds like I've gone down a complete rabbit trail, but project management teaches basic principles, uh, and I'm not 
certified either. But it was the basic thing of take anything and work break down and break it into small pieces and then, you know, track the small pieces and those small pieces become the end game. Uh, and we created a culture of, of everyone thinking like project management so that when the project started off and everyone's trying to figure out what, why are we in these meetings? What are you doing? What's a project plan? Who, you know, they were very, it would have been very confusing. Every department got so immersed in project management because it was, it helped us be successful. Yeah, and that's why I have it up here as one of the foundation of departments. You know, right there, project management administration. A lot of companies overlook that. These don't have to be unique people. One person can fulfill that role. So we implemented a sign on a lot of companies to help with project management. It's very easy to do, essentially notification and things like that. But I think Tammy's absolutely right. This is like your wheels. You know, the tires aren't flat, they're rolling forward. The rest of it takes care of itself. There was another question here that had their hand raised oh, a moment go. ago before I dashed. Was that you, Jen? Okay. Hi, guys. Thanks for your time. I'm Cam with uh, Pizza Guys. We're a 75-unit franchise chain. We're about 90% franchised. Uh, we mandate our tech stack for all of our franchisees, and that gets uh, very you know, expensive at times when you're, when you're looking at implementing new technologies. And uh, We obviously do our due diligence, but I want to see what strategies you guys recommend for um, you know, when we, when we go to roll out, there's all these new technologies. I've met a lot of new people here. You know, how, how can we protect ourselves against getting into bed with uh, a technology that later on is going to get obsolete? Um, well, I thought I knew where you were going, and then you took a curve at the end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, I'm ready to talk. Well, you can um, answer that one, too, I guess. Yeah, well, most of the brands that I've ever worked with that do franchising ended up um, having a, a large franchise base before they realized, oh crap, technology was important and now I can't mandate it. And hats off to you that you're a new brand and you saw that right out of the gate and said, here's the box, you got to buy the box. Just like the food, just like the sign on the outside. Um, uh, how, you, how you don't get into technology that can someday be obsolete, I, I think probably goes back to what we talked about a while ago, which is have a roadmap and understand what all the pieces are, and be sure that what you're providing your franchisees is, is delivering value to them. So uh, you probably already do this, but we would always pick the, like, like three key franchisees who are very influential, and that's always the hard part, because sometimes they're your worst enemies, and if, you can't screw up with them. But to bring them in up front, and when they say, oh my God, great, everybody else just gets in line, uh, is my experience. Yeah, the Franchise Advisory Council is, is really important yeah. in that regard. The other thing is I showed you the tiers of different types of technology. Um, my recommendation would be be very conservative on the base technology, okay, because that's what's going to have to be there for a long, long time. And so, and that's where you have to really make sure, don't do bleeding edge on, on your base because you could really hurt yourself. If you want to do bleeding edge on some revenue generating app to see how it goes or even online ordering, that's, that's fine because you can change that out without a lot of pain. But the, the real stuff that's really foundational and core to your brand, uh, be, be careful with that. Toby? So much of our business that we do is with franchised organizations. As they get larger, it, it, the growth vehicle is normally through franchising. And what we always recommend to our clients is use the carrot versus the stick approach to get adoption. So as, as Fred said, you know, you, or, and Tammy did as well, you bring the, the dissenters un, into the tent and they become the evangelists if you do your job correctly. And you let them see the process as it goes along. And so what happens is they recognize the value that you're putting around the technology and the due diligence that you're doing. Um, and so what tends to happen is they then go out and they evangelize those solutions. And sometimes the most negative people can be the most positive. The other tool that I would suggest you potentially look at is some form of a technology fee. And you create the, the bundled approach that says, we will take care of your technology. And let's not worry who the POS is. You know, right now it's POS 1. Five years from now it could be POS 2. But you pay a technology fee, everything's included. So what does that do for the franchisee? It gets him out of the technology business and gets him back in the food business. So when a franchisee opens a restaurant, five boxes appear in their restaurant. And the next day uh, somebody comes to pull the cable. And the next day somebody comes out to train them. And they're like, this is great. Now what you've done is not only added value from a technology perspective, but you've created value around your brand because your brand differentiation is your ability to leverage technology and be, to be able to deliver that solution. And now three years from now, you might decide that for whatever reason you made a bad decision with that POS vendor, you move to another one. Guess what happens? The next month, a new POS system shows up there. 
The technology fee doesn't change. As far as they're concerned, you are the landlord of their technology. I think change management is really difficult in that position if you do change, because you have to rechain in that really. But, but um, yeah, and, and I'm assuming your franchise agreements, if you, if you mandate technology, you also have a time limit on that. You have the ability to change it every X number of years, right? And that sort of saves you from a legal standpoint, but, um, but logistically, it's still a nightmare when you change things out. So due diligence on your vendors is extraordinarily important, obviously, and mostly, you know, the core, if you're talking about point of sale or back office or something like that. Um, just you've got to make sure that they've got you know you've got good recommendable cu uh, customers and not ones that they give you but ones you can find on your own that have the truth. Um, you go in and talk to them, uh, not not just their favorites, and um, and and of course you know company viability, um, support ability, um, you know the, the questions that you can ask and these are typically in RFPs and things you know the, the, just trying to vet out the vendor itself, not just the product. Um, total total very 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 important. Yeah, we have a responsibility to bring to you on an RFP vendors that we think will be in business, you know, in the next few years. I mean, look, I, I love Innovation Alley. It's great. You know, there's some great people out there. There's some people who have a real company that are really solving real problems. Others have a nice feature that may not be a company, but it's kind of a nice thing you can do. And, you know, but God bless them for, for trying that. Uh, and then the, the guys paying the big bucks in the big room, a lot of them been around for a long time. But look, at we're going through the most disruption this industry has ever seen from a technology standpoint. I mean, POS, you know, my God, I mean, that's like the dinosaurs are dying and the mammals are coming alive. Uh, and then, you know, and I'm going to remember having to pay $1,000 per location to get in the back door. I mean, that was BS for the longest time. Now with open architecture, cloud, uh, POS is changing. So it's really, it's really evolved very, very rapidly. Hey, and one more thing, and I, I don't, I'm sorry, Toby, did you have something? No, no. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think what you said about stay away from um, new vendors and, you know, the, the latest and greatest, and, you know, I, I think... There's a pros and cons of that as well. For a base, even even with a base. I mean, I've taken some. If you're a CIO, and you've got a brand that's got some weight behind you, and you can control almost everything about the deployment of a new technology. Like we did this when I was a CIO for Hard Rock. We did. You know, we were one of the first customers for Symphony. That was a point, cloud point of sale. It was the biggest pain in the ass. I, I thought I was. I was nuts. It was. It was, it was crazy. But I got to go to Europe and it was, yeah. whatever. Um, but but it was. Uh, but it was really hard. But but because I could fly to to Columbia, Maryland, and have a conversation with the president and say, look, you know, we're going to put pressure on you until you get this right. So you, there's, there's obviously, if if you want to have something that's different than the status quo, you've got to be willing to stand up and and kind of run that a little bit more succinctly than you would otherwise. Hey, Alex Becker with uh, with Toast. I figured I got a question in here from the uh, from the vendor perspective. I know there are a few in the room. Quite simply, um, you know, you talked about the kind of three part relationship between between vendors, operators, and consultants. From a consulting perspective, what do you wish vendors would do more of, and what do you wish vendors would do less of? Wow, that could be a whole show by itself. <laughs> yeah, wait, go ahead. Call me, go ahead. You okay. haven't talked. So, I, I think I, I think the biggest thing is that operators. I'm sorry, vendors need to spend more time understanding the operator and not chasing what they think. There's a great Chinese fortune cookie that says, do not confuse temptation with opportunity. And what that means is that every, every opportunity is not the right one for you. And, and whether it's a person like us who helps you validate and vet that out through requirements to make sure it's really a good fit, you can't be afraid to walk away from it. Uh, and I would say the same thing for the operators. Operators too often um, take the approach that says, oh, my buddy goes, runs, a, runs a donut brand over there and I run a chicken, fast, fast casual chicken. I'll just do whatever he does. And it's just, it's a poor idea. It, it does not work. Um, the other thing that I would try to keep vendors away from is what we like to call the magic act, which is where you go to do a presentation for an operator and you show them all the things you want to show them. And shame on the operator who allows that to happen. Because the operator should go into that meeting prepared with a short list that says, that's great, I really like that, but show me how you do this, this is important to my business, give me an idea how you do that. Um, and and the, the conversation needs to be much better. This isn't speed dating. You're going to be together for a long time. And we see our role as, as a marriage counselor. You know, The first thing we do when we start with a client is, can you not get along with your existing vendor? And if so, why? Irreconcilable differences. Okay, we got it. All right, so now we move on and we make sure that the next time we get into this relationship, you guys both know what you're signing up for. You know, you, you've asked for this, they need that. Are you willing to deploy in this period of time 
And in return, they're going to give you that. Because it's only a good deal if it's good for you and it's good for the operator. That's a good point. I would, I would just add to that, uh, as a vendor, just sit on the same side as the operator. You know, really sit in their shoes and understand where they're coming from. If you want to have a long-term relationship, you're going to make that sale yet, but you may make it later on. Uh, we are sadly out of time, so all these guys are still on the clock. They're able to answer your questions for free. I think we can do one more question, One, one, Fred. one more question. One so, more. Okay, so one more question. Here we go. Uh, Luke Sumter with Earth Cafe. Um, I'm curious, what do you guys do for um, companies that want to implement a new technology solution, but they don't have an operations team? You know, the operations team is your area managers or your general managers. How do you guys tackle, you know, those challenges that come with that? If they don't, ha they don't have any infrastructure above store supervision. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, they don't have a team of people to go out and train or show, you know. Oh. how that technology is going to work or how those changes are going to take effect? Uh, well, there's a consulting group that does just about everything. So if you, you can't roll it out without training them. And so some of the models that I've used before is in a rare occasion, you might bring in an external con uh, consultant group that does training and they do really, really well. They know how to package it, train it, roll it. They're expensive. So another model is um, using train the trainer. And so you have key ops people who are a part of the project, whether it's an area person or a GM, but it's whoever you trust that represents how you want your brand to run. Somebody's got to know how it ought to be done, right, that you trust. And I'd bring them in the inner circle of the project team. And when it comes time to roll it out, the best trainers to roll it out anyway are, are store trainers. I mean, operators that actually live this thing every day, um, far better than bringing in just, you know, external trainers. So I'd bring them in and propagate the train-the-trainer model. And if that you, and if really you well. set up a model store that has all the bells and whistles there and then bring people in to see how well it runs, you'd be surprised how quickly people adopt something. Thank okay, you. well, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking this uh, panel for willing to share their time. And have a great rest of the show.